think that's it. I may try to make sure you do that. Thank you very much. Good evening or good afternoon, whatever you guys would like to have it be at this point in time, right? What is it? Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Yes. yes. So, uh, as Javier said, my name is Sherlock Washington, and I'm just so very, very pleased when he has these types of classes to be able to come and share a little bit with each and every one of you what I do and what I find very, very interesting and fun uh, during the summer months. Obviously, I, I, uh, I'm going to be speaking about beat baseball. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. But first, I feel that I should perhaps uh, get uh, you know just get a little feel for the room. All right. Um, you guys don't know this at this point in time. I am blind, so I, I, I use a cane. This is the way that I kind of get around and do the things that I need to do. I was diagnosed uh, with an eye condition at the age of seven called RP. It stands for retinitis pigmentosa. And uh, the doctors had said at the time to my parents, well, you know, he may keep the vision that he has, or as he gets older, he may gradually lose more and more of his vision. And it just so happens that when I was in high school, right before uh, my junior or senior year of high school, I started to lose quite a bit of my vision. I lost the majority of it right before going off to college. And, uh, you know, I was, you know, figuring out what, you know, what, what am I going to do with my life and do the things that I need to do. One of the things that I used to enjoy quite a bit uh, when I had a lot more vision was to be very active in sports. And, you know, as a kid, one of the things was, you know, racing bicycles, you know, so we would all get on our bikes. Um, you know, I just remember that I had a 10-speed ton. You guys probably know about 10-speed bicycles at the time. And it was called a free spirit, right? That's what I felt when I jumped on this thing, a free spirit. So I would always race my bike uh, with, with the friends and everything else and always basically come up first place and doing all the things that I need to do. I love competition. But as I started losing more and more and more of my vision, I said to myself, well, I'm not going to be able to race bikes too much anymore. And the reason I could figure out I wasn't going to be doing that, one time I went on a bike ride and I was following a bunch of my friends and we were on this trail and all of a sudden they had veered off to the right. So I'm like, what are they, what are they doing? Why are they veering off to the right? It looks like a clear road ahead of me. So I keep riding straight ahead and it happens to be a chain link fence. All right, so I pumped up in the air and I come back down and I said, you know, I think that I'm going to probably have to retire this bicycle stuff for a long time, okay? So, um, you know, certain things that we feel that we can do and then we can't do them as well as we did before, but I still always wanted to be competitive. I always wanted to uh, be active in sports. I mean, play basketball uh, with my friends and when I was younger, I was very, very good when I was able to see, take those three-point shots make those shots all the time, I was very good at that. Um, but as I started losing more and more of my vision, you know, that wasn't as fun for me because I started losing more. So I decided that, you know, there's got to be some things that are out there that someone like myself that is blind or visually impaired can still get involved in. And that's when at the age of 14 I got involved with the ABANJ. That stands for Association for Blind Athletes of New Jersey. And that gave me, uh, or afforded me, the opportunity of being able to compete locally here in the state of New Jersey. We'd always have, uh, you know, state tournaments where they would have blind and visually impaired individuals come from all over the state and participate if it was track and field, if it was swimming, um, you know, judo, uh, you're talking about uh, wrestling, all the types of sports that I didn't even think, wow, you know, somebody who's blind and visually impaired, can you do that? Well, I got really involved in track and field, you know, because I was kind of fast, right? Fast bicycle rider, that whole nine yards. So I was involved heavily in, in track and field. So when I kind of qualified on the state level, they said, you know, Sherlock, you're good enough for us to bring with us when we go nationally. So therefore, I was able to be uh, picked out and, and go with the team on a national level and we would travel all over the country to compete with other blind and visually impaired individuals. So anywhere from California, Arizona, New Mexico, um, you know, Texas, you name the state when they had a World Series, uh, or I should say a Nationals, I was always there. And the great part about that was, I was always coming in first or second in like the 100 meter or the 200 meter dash. 
and even a 440. If you get past that, forget about me. You know, I take a back seat. Forget about that. I'm not a long distance person, so if you're talking about these guys that do all these uh, athlons and everything else, forget about it. I'm not involved after my 440 or 400 meter. You know, I'm done. Well, um, after being able to qualify for all those things, and like I said, coming in first and second in all those heats, I also loved high jumping, right? And you're probably thinking, is this guy serious? He's talking about high jumping? Yes, high jumping. So what I would do, because my vision wasn't all that great, was to walk up to the bar. The bar is like this. I'd walk up to the bar, and I'd touch it. And then after, I would take all my steps back. And then after, I would run and just average where those steps were, leap up in the air, and do whatever that uh, possibly flop or whatever I wanted to do to get over the bar. So I was always number one in the country for doing that. So back in 1990, I was chosen to represent the United States in the Paralympics. And I had gone to Holland, Assen in Holland, to represent the US. And there, I came in third in the world in the high jump. So I said, you know, after that, I don't really think that I can do much more than I was able to do at that point in time. Because those other guys, too, they were really, really, really very good. So um, after this World Championship for the Paralympics, and I said, well, I need to get involved in something else that I need to see how well I can do. So there was another sport that the ABA and J had, and it was also a national sport, which is also an international Paralympic sport, called goal ball. And what goal ball is, is let's just imagine that there is a volleyball court. And a volleyball court's about 18 meters long and about 9 meters wide. So they have this ball that's the size of a medicine ball, maybe a little bit bigger than a basketball, a small than a medicine ball. And it would be this hard rubber ball that had bells in it. And there would only be three guys uh, for it on a team uh, on that side of the court. And what they would try to do is defend their goal. The whole width of the nine meters was just a, like a soccer goal. So what we would have to do, of course, because everybody has different visual acuity, <laughs> what they would do is they put everybody in blindfolds or sleep shapes. So this way it would be even for everyone. And you would take the ball, and you would roll the ball as hard as you possibly could across the other side of the court and try to get it uh, behind the other three defenders, get it in their goal. So uh, for the first time back in 1993, we were able to bring New Jersey's first gold medal for that sport of gold ball. So then I said, OK, you know what? This is fun. This is a, this is a wonderful opportunity. It's a great sport. And we got this gold medal that nobody's ever achieved here in the state of New Jersey before. Um, I need to do something else. Well, I played gold ball for another couple of years, and then a friend of mine approached me, and he said, Sherlock, I've got this really cool game that was started in the 60s, and it still goes on today, and I'd like you to see if you'd like to come out and try out for the team. I'm like, well, what, what, what's the sport? What, what are we talking about here? And he said, it's baseball. I said, come on. This is where you hit the ball, right? you got to round the bases and, and all the other stuff. Somebody tags you out. And that kind of, I said, I don't know how well that's going to work out. But he said, no, 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 it's, it's, it's an adaptive sport of baseball. So I'm here to actually share a little bit about that particular sport, which uh, I'm involved in uh, right now. For you. And as we know in baseball, there are how many bases in baseball? Four. There you go. That's right. I got my baseball, my, my champion down here. I remember <laughs> all about sports. All right. There are four bases. But in beep baseball, there's only three bases. There's first base, <coughs> then there's second base, I'm sorry, first base, third base, and then your home plate, okay? And then you're saying, well, then you have a pitcher and a catcher. And the pitcher pitches to you, and you're swinging your bat, making connection with the ball, and it's supposed to go out in the outfield. But all this is being done under sleep shades. You have to be blindfolded to play this game. So you're saying, well, how is somebody going to hit a ball if they can't see the ball coming, right? Is that what you're thinking? Okay, good, good. I, I, I didn't know if you guys all left or not. I don't know if you guys were And then all of a sudden, it's the third base that's going off. So they have to quick turn around and come back into the other area. And since they're under these sleep shades, 
they have to be able to hear where the bass is. So the bass is first and third bass, they buzz. They make a buzzing noise, okay? And the, boast, the bass, I should say, is about four feet high. Here is the bass right here. And what we are to do at this point in time when the speaker goes off in this bass is to run it as hard, as fast as we possibly can and tackle this bass. All right? So it's like a, a combination of baseball, football, right? So I've got to tackle this bass, and the bases are 100 feet away from home plate. And we all know that baseball is how many feet away? My baseball man here? 90. 90? 90? What's all for, for, for like, uh, what do they call it? Uh, not junior, what do they call that? Lily. Little League. That's 60. Yeah. For, for regular baseball, it's 90 feet. And what they have for us is 100 feet away. And the reason that they had this 100 feet away is because it used to be 90 feet, but because the score of the games were so high, it was like football games. 52 to 38, you know? Because as soon as you got this base, it counts as a run, all right? And I said to you too, when you hit the ball, it goes out in the outfield. And there are six guys that are out in the outfield. And they're supposed to listen to this ball, and the two spotters are sighted and they're behind them that tell them what zone that ball has been hit in. Once that zone has been called, we're supposed to converge on that zone, and we're supposed to dive on the ground and have the ball hit off of us, and we're supposed to grab the ball and pick it up in the air before the person touches his base. If we do that before they touch the base, obviously it is a, a out. If they can touch the base before we get the ball, the possession of the ball, have control over the ball, then it counts as an out, okay? So, or they're safe. So, I think I'm saying that, right? So if they catch the ball before we get to the base, it's an out. If I hit this base before they pick up the ball, it's a run. Okay, so that's how it's done. So they moved it 100 feet away so that this way the ball games wouldn't be as high as it once was when it was 90 feet away or 60 feet away when they started off the game. Um, I, I, I enjoyed the sport the first time I went out. I was in Denver, Colorado. When I was a rookie at the time, I never had any experience basically hitting off a pitcher that was throwing a ball to me and me being able just to swing the bat and make a connection and then running to one of these two bases. So once that had taken place and I hit my first ball and ran and tackled this, I was, like I said, I was hooked. That was my new sport. And I said, anything that I can do to play this sport every year is what I'm going to get involved in. Now, I've been very, very fortunate. I've played with so many teams around the league because New Jersey never had a beat baseball team. So I would play with teams from Chicago. That's where I started off, actually. I played with a team out of Chicago. And I played with them for a number of years. I played with another team outside of Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. I played with a team from um, Colorado. Uh, I played on a team from Pennsylvania. And uh, there's been a lot of other people. Well, I, I left the, the, uh, the last for, I should say, the best for last. I also played on a team in California. They called me back in 2009. And they said, well, Sherlock, you know what? We're looking for uh, some another player, and we would like you to come and play. I said, well, what do you mean? You guys already got a, a championship last year. He said, well, you know what? We'd feel better if you're playing with us as opposed to playing against us. So I said, OK. I went and played with them in 2009, and I received my first world championship ring from doing that. And I was invited, of course, to come back again in 2010. And I was also able to get another ring in 2010. Well, 2011 comes by, but I was unable to play with them that year because they had said, look, Sherlock, this is the ABA and J I'm going back to. They had said, Sherlock, look, you've been playing this sport for all these years. We've been sending you all over the country to play. And you promised us that you were going to start a team here in New Jersey. So that's when we started the team called the New Jersey Lightning. And the New Jersey Lightning was founded from the ABA and J, again, Association for Blind Athletes. And we had, you know, scattered around the state of New Jersey, found individuals that had an interest in playing the sport. And we said, listen, guys, um, we would like to give you guys an opportunity, an opportunity to play competitive, competitively, um, play where you can travel all across the country and see what we can do to put together uh, a world championship team. So we just uh, came back at the end of uh, July, beginning of August, 
from uh, Rochester, Minnesota. That's where they had the Beat Baseball World Series this year. And uh, we didn't do as great as I'd like, but we did a lot better than we did last year. We were three and five. Now, I've been talking about this Beat Baseball stuff, and you guys are saying, well, I haven't heard anything yet. Well, right in front, I have someone who has one of the balls. So we're going to pass it around. First, he's going to do, because we have to activate the ball. So we're going to pull the pin, and there it is. All right? So he's going to pass it around so you guys can have an idea as to the weight of the ball. And just imagine that somebody's hitting this ball with a, maybe a 36 or 38 ounce bat, and then that ball is going to come flying back at you, or it's going to come flying at the outfielders, and they have to get in front of this ball, and they have to get down and stop the ball before they can pick it up. <laughs> yeah, it gets annoying, yeah, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's one of the things that, that, that we, we enjoy. So this is the part of the equipment that they have, and they're always trying to improve on the equipment right now. This base where I'm standing in front of it's just made out of the spongy styrofoam type of material, because obviously if it had a pole that was stuck in the ground and stuff, I don't think that we'd last too long going for another one, right? So this is why it's nice and foam, and you tackle this thing, and um, you have a really, really great time doing that. So what I want to do is just to give you guys a little bit of, uh, of a video. It's a 20-minute video, and it just basically shares with you um, the, the team that we started and the, the guys that had gone out this year for the 2014 World Series to represent New Jersey, okay? Are we okay with that? Mm -hmm. sure. yeah. PJ, you? Yeah. PJ is an audio-visual man, so you can get that point. The New Jersey Light in the 2014 MDF. Sport in which I truly love, and I get to share some of that love with you guys. Um, like I said, this, this team is, is five years old. Uh, we continue to, to look for individuals and volunteers, and by saying volunteers, there is a gentleman that's here with me today. His name is Pamo Musharraf, and that's the gentleman who actually did this video for us. When he came on board, he wanted to come in because he's visually impaired, but he also has hearing loss as well. So when he came on board, he said, look, um, I, I want to play the sport. I'd like to, to, to be able to, to just do whatever I can. I love baseball, and whatever I can do to be active, I'd like to talk, take part in doing that. Well, he'd come on, and when we were playing locally, it was okay for us to you know, maybe stand by the base because of his hearing. We had to yell whichever base went on. We had to yell base, 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 so he knew which direction that he needed to run it. And um, we couldn't do that on a world stage or a national championship games. They wouldn't actually have us kind of change the rules to, to accommodate that. But he knew that, and he said, look, Sherlock, look, whatever, whatever I can do, if it's just basically even carrying, bringing water to the guys, Whatever I can do to, to get myself involved, I'd love to basically be a part of this. Well, his energy, his motivation, and just him being such an individual that's so, so very, very positive, I knew we could not lose this great man. And this is before I knew what he could do with the video camera and taking pictures and everything else that he's done. So it's been an immense, an immense help for us getting this information out on YouTube and, and, and Facebook. And uh, I would like him to perhaps come up right now, and, and, and we can just thank him for what he's done for us today, and as well share a little bit of his story with us as well, too. I think it's important. Amal? Um, now that you've pumped up my ego, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have that kindness. Uh, Professor, have you told us that the students have covered Usher's single? We just did on uh, Tuesday. We went over it briefly, and I said I would get someone to come in and talk about, you know, either being deaf or whatever. So this is a great opportunity, actually. Well, I've been blessed with Usher's single. Usher's syndrome is deaf blindness. In my case, uh, the, various, um, the deafness uh, was noticed first as a child. Um, that was. Um, I struggled in school because the moment the teacher would give a lot that I'm reading the lips. Um, and the blindness, the redness, red night is pigment toaster, which Sherlock had, is a progressive disease. Uh, the retina cells, which is like the film in the camera, the eye of the camera, the film in the, uh, the retina. The retina cells start dying. Lucky for me that my retina cells uh, started dying from the periphery in. So I started losing 
peripheral vision. And even today, like an average person, you guys have 160 degrees visual field, and mine is one and a half degree. So the kind of thing that I struggle with is I can't see the hand if somebody wants to shoot my hand. So that makes me an extrovert. I'm always the first one to get that out of the way. <laughs> um, I was never an athlete, um, but I, well, my thing was I'd like to, I wanted to travel. And as I started losing vision, um, I, I, I lost my ability to drive a car in 2008, uh, 2009, March 2009. Um, so I, you know, slowly the lifestyle changes. I'm a carless and carefree living man. So, um, so what I wanted to do was to travel. And as I'm losing the sight, I, I don't want to miss out on the great cities of the world. And I noticed in sports, I can do it through this long, slow running. And um, so I thought this is great. So I actually participated in your, you guys have a half marathon here. And I ran that, uh, it was wonderful, I uh, Rutgers half marathon. And I said, okay, I can do better, I can do maybe a marathon. So over the years, I have actually run the New York City marathon, the San Francisco marathon, the Chicago marathon. I even went to Missoula, Montana, ran the marathon over there. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's great to discover cities on foot. So I've been doing that. Um, and then the, when this the opportunity came to join this team, I was so excited. And um, unfortunately, I couldn't participate as a player because I can't hear the ball or the, uh, the beeping. Uh, but you know what? Um, you guys you guys are going to go ahead to, I'm thinking for a message for you. This is vision and uh, hearing and vision is not the biggest disability. It doesn't stop me. It doesn't stop anybody. The bigger, there are bigger disabilities out there. You know, there more than two thirds of the country is depressed. Depression is a bigger disability. You can't focus. You know, the inability to love is a bigger disability. You know, the, the lack of imagination is a bigger disability. You know, imagination is the biggest thing. You know, um, the greatest writer in the world, people give credit to Homer. He bought a whole new world, the ancient Greece to life. He was blind. You know, Beethoven was dead. Uh, it's, it's just, um, I guess, imagination is something that uh, you don't have to be even good looking. You know, to be <laughs> yeah. there was an ugly man, you know, just, you know, out 27, a few miles down out 27, there was an ugly man who imagined that he was on a beam of light, traveling at light speed through the universe, and he imagined the universe. He came up with a theory of relativity, you know. So I'm, I'm, maybe I'm the only one who thinks Einstein is ugly, but <laughs> 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 anyway, thank you so much for having us here. why I couldn't have a good man like this go, right? Yes. You're always, yes. well, always finding your camp room for anyone that's going to be positive and is going to add to anything that you're dreaming of or whatever your goal and whatever your mission. Um, and everybody has a purpose. I know that for a fact. And I knew that his purpose was to be a part of this New Jersey Lightning League baseball team. Um, we always look for volunteers, obviously. I'm going to do my volunteer pitch now. So if anybody wants to come out and actually see what this game is about live, maybe we can basically put some blindfolds on you guys and have you take a swat at the bat and ball and, and, and run to one of these bases and, and tag it and touch it so you have an idea as to how it is to experience life through someone who's blind or visually impaired. Um, a lot of times we, you know, we take so much for granted um, the things that we do each and every day, and once we don't have those certain things, then we say, wow, this is, uh, you know, life is, is closed off to me. There's nothing that I can do any longer. Remember, I was telling you guys earlier, you know, I didn't think that I was going to be able to, to, to maybe race bikes or run or do all the things that I, I wanted to do, but there's always a way. There's a will, there's always going to be a way. So um, uh, I'd definitely love for you guys to come out. I don't know if there may be something that I might be forgetting to, to, to make mention of. I did tell you guys, though, that we do have a little extra plus when we play baseball, because in baseball, there are three strikes. In this game, 
we get four strikes. So listen, <laughs> listen, 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 every strike counts, believe me. Every, every little bit helps, every little bit helps. So um, I don't know how much time to know. We, we got a little time, actually. Um, we can take some questions. That's what I would like to do, yeah. If you'd like to ask <coughs> myself or Amo any questions, we're here for you this evening. So please, by all means, ask away. Don't raise the hands, though. You'll be, like, tired. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. The website where you guys can obviously friend the page is uh, the New Jersey Lightning Beat Baseball, which is the Facebook. I know a lot of you guys are in social media, so you know Facebook, right? Um, the organization ABANJ.org is the organization that funds our sport as well. Uh, that, that website is going to be undergoing some changes very, very soon, so please forgive what you see at this point in time. It's going to get better, okay? We've got an AMO on our top, on our team, so that's why it's, <laughs> it's going to get better, all right? So that, that, yeah, so if you look at Facebook, you know, befriend the New Jersey Lightning Beat Baseball team, and uh, we'll be happy to accept that friendship. Anybody else? Uh, when does the base start? Coordinated with the ball, or how does the how does it start beeping right after? The that's ball? a great that's a great question. As you know, when you're pulling out that pin, that ball is constantly beeping. So and that's beeping because of the outfield that needs to hear the beeping when they have someone call out a particular zone. They need to hear that ball as it comes closer, beeping, so they can jump in front of it. But for the base, it's an automatic thing. As soon as I basically if they say set ready ball or ready pitch that base should be activated so this way I know when I make contact with the ball what direction I'm going to be running in. It's a great question. So someone activates that? Yes, yeah, someone is going system. to be a base operator. Okay. So they're the ones that will basically either trigger first or third. So if they're big partial to first base, maybe we'll go to first base a little bit more, <laughs> that kind of thing. So, But they try to at least get someone to kind of mix it up a little bit so you don't know where you're going to be going automatically. So that's a great question. Anybody else? What parts of New Jersey are your players from? Well, they're all the way from the northern part of the state all the way down to South Jersey. So a lot of these players, sometimes they take a couple hours through, uh, there's a service called Access Link, which uh, kind of parallels the paratransit. So that's for folks with disabilities that need to get around. And um, you know, some of them can start as early as maybe 5 o'clock or 5, 4, 30, 5 o'clock in the morning. So they can get to Matawan where we have our practices for 8.30 in the morning. So it takes a lot of dedication. Maybe we hit a grand slam? Uh, close. And what it is is if you can hit the ball 170 feet in the air and have it come down, um, that is automatically a home run, which is, that means that if you just you give you 30 seconds. So if, I, if that was me, believe me, I'd just like, you know, crawl to the base, whatever. I got 30 seconds to do that. And when I touch this base, it counts as two runs. And you get a trophy for that. It doesn't happen very often at all. I think in the whole history of beat baseball, it may have happened maybe two or three times. But if you feel the ball, it's, it's, a, it's a very heavy ball. And then you're trying to get that ball 100 power, that 170 feet in the air before it lands. So it's not an easy feat to do. That was a middle bat, right? What kind of bat? Oh, yeah. These are all aluminum softball bats. The bat that I like to use is called the Black Max. <laughs> and it's a 34 ounce, I mean, I'm sorry, 38 ounce bat, um, 34 inch, 34 inch, 38 ounce bat. Anybody else? This side of the room. Um, what, is, what are one of the, like, hidden benefits of the well, you get to hit, meet some real nice people. <laughs> right? I mean, I remember when I was in college. I mean, the great thing about me being somewhat, some visually impaired, you know, people always want to sometimes come out and, and, and help, right? So you're always able to, to meet some really nice people, really. I remember one time there was someone who approached me, and they said, could I talk to you? I'm like, well, I seem like a monster. <laughs> <laughs> of course you talk. You know, and she said, you know, for the longest time, I was afraid to come up and talk to you. And then I'm like, scratch my mom, I, mean, I know I took a shower that day. <laughs> I was afraid to come up and talk to me. Why would you be afraid? Then she explained, she said, I always thought that someone who's blind, they count their steps. 
2,498, right? Somebody messes up my count, I gotta go start all over again. So, so, but she didn't know, but I kind of explained that's not usually how things are working, but like I said, you get a chance to meet some wonderful people and get to share a little bit about your life with those individuals as well. So it kind of opens up, I mean, I don't know how many of you here may have gone to school and you had someone who was blind or visually impaired, or someone with a disability. And how many of you said, you know what, I'm going to go up and talk to that person. Normally, I used to always say to folks, when there's a kid usually around, and I always sense this a lot because I'm walking, I have my cane out, and I'm, and I'm, I'm just cruising around, and then somebody says, Mommy, what's that? And, all the, Shh. She says, you know? and she stops the child from being curious and asking the question. Now, if you continue to stop a child from asking a question, now they're going to feel you know what, there's something wrong. There's something not right with that person. We're not supposed to talk about them. We're not supposed to basically, you know, say anything to them. Now, they become isolated because of what was taught to them. And that's why I say, if there's anybody that I hear asking a question, I'm always the first one to say, no, 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 that's a good question. And I'm going to answer that question for that young man or young lady. It's a very, very important thing that everybody remembers, because it starts when you're very, very, very young. And that's how you get yourself uh, in a situation where you're more receptive to someone that has a different ability, I like to call it sometimes. Someone else have a question? I have one. Sure. Um, can you tell us about, like, if there's any, like, different assistive technology here, like apps and stuff like that that you need? Oh, you're getting me excited. <laughs> you're getting me excited. You're getting me excited. All right. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. What's on my what's on my waist here? Stun gun. Stun gun. This is, I'm coming over to you, Professor Robbins. <laughs> this is an iPhone, and the greatest piece that uh, Steve Jobs did for us was to make sure that we had inclusion. Being by that is that he made sure that this device was able to be used by not only someone that was blind, not only someone that was hearing impaired because you know the vibration and everything else, not only someone that may have dexterity issues and that type of thing. This device is inclusive. It does it all right out of the box. I don't have to buy this device and then turn around and then I have to get this device and then say, I need to buy another piece of software to load on this device so I can use it, okay? So I received this app just the other day, when we talked about apps, you got me excited, I told you that. <laughs> so this app is called uh, KNFB Reader. If you have a moment, I'm going to share with you how that works, okay? We're in a classroom, right? In the beginning, I'm sure that Professor Robles had probably gotten you guys a syllabus, did he not? Yeah, you make sure you did or else I'm going to make sure you get the bad mark. Of course, he's got to give you a syllabus, right? And in the syllabus that you guys have, he hands it out. But what happens if there's someone that's in this classroom that's blind or visually impaired? What would happen? Exactly. So therefore, you guys will have all the information, and that person will have to wait till he gets home or have someone else take the opportunity to read that syllabus to him. So I'm going to share uh, an app that I just got yesterday to show you how cool this is. And, but I'm going to need something. Somebody has to give me something to, um, to use as an example. You have a, a, a document, paper, something? Oh, you have <laughs> Professor Robles' syllabus? Nice! What a plug for Mr. Robles, huh? Tree covers. Uh, I'm going to take that from you. Thank you. Uh, here I am sitting in the classroom, just been handed over this document. Here we go. I'm going to move this to the side here. I'm going to take my handy dandy iPhone out. I'm going to take the plug out of here, because obviously we're talking about, I'm going to borrow this for a second. I'm only doing this for you guys, of course, I wouldn't have to do this if it wasn't Because you need to hear this, right? I'm talking about beat baseball, all the other things that beat, the talk, and everything else, so you have to hear this. I don't know if it's going to fit, because it feels like the plug might be a little bit too big. It is too big. I'm sorry, hold on a second. It's a little too big yet. It's not fitting inside my, in my cases. So I'm going to have to do something else. And I'm going to hold, oh, you have a microphone, right? Let's see, you have a microphone. Um, do you Well, it's okay. Well, once I do what I'm going to do, then we're going to use that microphone to say, if we can get it ready. Oh, yeah. Now, 
as we know with an iPhone, it's a flat screen, right? There's no tactile markings on this device at all, only maybe you've got your home key, right, which everybody has, and uh, you have your volume up and down, you've got that little switch that turns it from ring to vibrate, and then you've got your power button on the right other side that basically helps us, right? So I'm able to navigate using this device by just using touch and just gestures with my hands. I can either swipe when I go from application to application. Once I find the application that I need, I just double tap and then it launches the application. So right now I'm going to find that app that I talked about. Our audio visual man can't mix together. It's okay, take your time. All right. Now, I, I, I opened up this application and it just told me that I need to take a picture of the document. Imagine that, I turn into a cameraman. Okay. So I hold that, I put the document flat on the, I put the iPhone flat on the document. We weren't expecting <laughs> That's the new kind of beat baseball. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to join you soon. <laughs> I don't think PJ gets paid enough. <laughs> I guess not. I'm trying. <laughs> That's OK. As long as we try, that's all I'm asking. Well, you know what? Let me do this and I bring it towards you. Is that okay? Because I don't need you to bring it over here. I'm just going to show them what this is going to do. Okay? Alright. So what I'm going to do right now is I have this document. I'm sorry you guys are not going to see it because I think there's something that's hiding it from you. Right? But... Okay, here we go. You heard it say take picture, right? It's laying flat on the document. I'm now going to put the document back on the stand here. And I'm going to lift it about, mm, about this high. Eight, eight inches, ten inches, somewhere around there. Now double tap.
lines of service in this building. Might be a little difficult, right? Because this uses actually the internet. And what this does is it will go out and there are key. Oh, did you hear that? Can you say it again? <laughs> okay. All right, so it does work, okay? So anything that I have that I can take a picture if I'm not sure what it is, it will basically tell me or come back and tell me what's in front of me. So people sitting on chairs. <laughs> tells me a lot. People sitting on chairs. Okay. <laughs> so those are some of the things that this device has been able to open doors for us that were not opened in the past. I used to remember when I, you know, when I was uh, your age and I was in college, and there was no adaptive technology the way that we know it today. Um, I received my degree in computer science, so there was a lot of programming at that point. I had to have someone sitting next to me reading the screen to me, and I had to remember all those things that they were saying so that I could write my lines of code as well to do my program. All right, so it's come a long way. They've got screen reading software that allows us to navigate the computer screen. So this way I'm able to do those same things that you guys are able to do with your mouse. I'm able to do it with the computer as well. Okay. Oh, because you heard some of that when I was working with this computer. It has it right on here. Uh, it's called JAW, JAWS, which stands for Job Access and Speech. Okay. Good question, by the way. So we took a little trip down the technology road. What, what else? Does anybody else have a question for myself or Amal? Um, Go ahead. Um, I have a friend who recently lost his um, vision and goes well, slowly during college and he's taken a very like, negative. What would be your advice? Call me. Okay. <laughs> That's my advice. I'm going to give you my number when I leave. Okay. I'd like to talk to you. All right, and that's what it's all about. It's all about sharing. I mean, I'm sure he doesn't know anything about beat baseball. No. And knowing anything that he can still be so active and involved, and that really opens so many doors that we thought were once closed to us. Okay, so please, I'll be more than happy to speak with him. Thank you. Anyone else have a question? No, forget Amos here too. I'm trying to get Amos to answer a couple questions. Somebody has a question. I have a question. Uh, yeah. Is injury a prevalent thing during uh, beat baseball? Could be. Um, I broke a guy's nose this year. Anymore, so I didn't mean to. All right. But I hit the ball. He got in the way. Okay. <laughs> so the ball bounced, hit him in the hit him in the nose, and broke his nose. I didn't mean to do that. But then again, he was giving me a wide breath. Sure, I was coming. Let's just pass on. <laughs> pass through. Right. So that sometimes it can happen. It can happen. We try to do our best. There's one command that everybody knows very, very clearly when they yell this out in the field, and that is stop. When you hear stop, no matter what you're doing, you freeze, okay? Because either a player's going to collide with another player. You saw my buddy Doug, right? Are you okay? Are you all right? Right? Um, you know, he didn't realize, and, and nobody yelled stop, okay? So he ran into the infield because the way that they have the bases set up, it's on the outside of the foul territory line. So. This way you try not to get those athletes engaged with each other, especially one is running and somebody's running to try to pick up the ball as fast as they possibly can. So we try to do our best to make sure those kind of things, the collisions don't happen. I have a question for you, and I'm all, uh, what, what is the strangest thing someone has come up to you and either said or done because of your disability? Did you get that, Amo? Uh, I couldn't see it. Oh, I, I said, what is the strangest thing that someone has said or done, you know, come up to you because of your disability, that they've seen you have a disability and they've done something out of character or weird? For me, uh, since I don't carry a cane yet, uh, especially when it's darker, uh, because it contrasts the, uh, the, the night, the day contrasts the more, the rewards and cones you guys know. So since I have only central vision, the peripheral vision is what's responsible for the rods out there. So at night, I really. So I've had people think that I was probably drunk the way I walk. Uh, <laughs> I'm not able to walk this way. Um, I, I'm not, so I, and I don't have a cane, so they don't know that I'm uh, blind. So I've had people, come, you know, make comments, you know, thinking that I was drunk. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, he, he mentioned something that, that it kind of makes me reflect back when I was, um, I was young person and I was just not wanting to admit that I needed to use this and a group of friends of mine they didn't really know because you know I was like a vampire you know the vampires they go in during the day 
and they come out at night. When you have RP, it's the opposite way around. You want to get in the, the, as soon as you possibly can because I need the light to see. If there's no light, then I can't really function or get around. So we go to Great Adventure, Six Flags, and um, I'm thinking that we're going to get back. You know, it's summertime. It doesn't get dark until about 8 o'clock. Cool. They say, let's stay for the fireworks. And I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> Let's not say we did. <laughs> so I decide now that we're walking around. You know, I'm a very, very polite person. And we're walking, and you know, Great Adventure, it's crowded. There's people jostling, bumping into each other, and that kind of thing. So now, anytime when somebody brushes past me or whatever, I'm like, excuse me and pardon me. So one time, it's getting a little later now, it's getting dark, and I brush against someone, and I said, excuse me. And then my friend turns around and says, who are you talking to? I said, I just brushed uh, against a guy and said, excuse me. I said, that's not a guy, it's a tree. <laughs> so that was kind of the weird thing. I said, you know what, I've got to start carrying this. <laughs> well, the cane works like this, right? This one happens to be a telescopic cane because it's one that I enjoy. Are like very, very lightweight. And I use a fingertip grip on it, okay, because it's so lightweight. So what you do with a cane is it's actually extends an extension of my hand, right? If I were to touch the ground, I would kind of feel what's in front of me, okay? So as I'm walking, this cane is supposed to go to the opposite direction before I'm ready to take the next step. So now I'm moving it to the left. My right foot is coming across. I know it's clear. I'm moving it back to the right again. I know that my left foot is clear. So that's how we use the cane. And of course. If there's an object or something in the way, it will basically sense that for me, and I'm able to go around that object, up the stairs, down the stairs, things of that nature. That's how it came. And on that note, New Jersey was the first uh, state to have the seeing eye dog. And the first ever seeing eye dog was from Morristown, uh, New Jersey. And uh, if you go to Morristown, you go downtown there, there's a statue of a man and a dog. Uh, the seeing eye, that's right. So in fact, I'm considering getting my first seeing eye dog, so I can actually go out at night. And um, they told me that they have three breeds that they uh, choose from. There's a German Shepherd, the, um, the Labrador, and the Golden Retriever. That these are the, considered the best breeds for seeing eye dogs. Very smart dogs, by the way. Very, very intelligent. And it's a whole training process. Because so they will do a gate analysis of my walk, my particular walk and then assign a dog accordingly. And they train the dog for months, or like for years. And right. then I have to go there and spend one month with the dog in that facility to train him. And, that. and those dogs actually, uh, with the amount of training they invest in those dogs, about $40,000. And the person who's going to be a recipient of the dog, they're very fortunate though, they only have to pay anywhere from like 100 to 100 to $200. But the dog is a lot of responsibility. Amo just mentioned that uh, in Morristown, that's where they have the seeing eye. I remember back in the, uh, the late 80s, I had gone for my Juno walk, it's called, where someone simulates the dog's movements, all right? And it's one of the trainers, so this way, as Amo was saying, they gauge your step and that type of thing to find out which dog will best suit your particular gait and how your, your speed and your temperament, the whole nine yards. Well. When I thought about it, I went through this, they said, yes, Sherlock, you definitely qualify for a dog. And then I said, look, dog, mm, got to get up in the morning, take the dog out. The dog do this, but you know what? I like my cane. <laughs> but it's preference. It's all about preference. Anybody else have a question for us? Have ever beat someone with a cane? And also, can you spit darts from a cane? Can I spit what? Spit darts from? Spit dar oh no 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 no! Not, not this one. It's the other moss. It's the KX 122. No no no! no. It's just something really dark. And I, I I'm not beat anybody with my cane, but I can tell you when I'm walking through a very busy area. You know, some people just don't look, so they get themselves tripped up with the cane, and then they fall to the ground. It looks like I was beating them. <laughs> They beat themselves. I didn't do anything. <laughs> Anybody else have a question? Do you find that your other senses are more adept because you uh, have a lack of vision? You know, I, I, what I find is that I'm able to. I just, it's the focus because my hearing is the same as your hearing. Um, my, you know, 
feel, touch, uh, sense of smell. It's the same. But the only thing that's different is that I have to rely on them a lot more. So I don't say that they're enhanced or anything else, but I'm just relying on them a little bit more so they're a little bit sharper for me because I have to focus. I mean, you going across the street, you're looking both ways, you make your move, right? If I go and it's a busy intersection, guess what I'm doing? I'm waiting and I'm timing the traffic so that I know that it's my turn to go across. So there's a lot of things, or I know, you know what? I know where this place is, it's by the library, and how I know I'm by the library? The Dunkin' Donuts is right there, I always smell that fresh cup of coffee. So there's a lot of cues that you pick up and you cue in on that they're there for everyone, but sometimes we don't, you know, we're using our eyes. We don't need to worry about those things. Oh, it's right over there, right? And I love that too. Um, Javier, uh, Professor Robles said, does somebody ever say anything crazy to you when you are someone who's blind and visually impaired? There's a lot of crazy things that people do, you know? Not that they intentionally mean to do it, but if I go to someone and I say, hello, uh, you know, I, I'm trying to get to blah, 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 and they said, it's right over there. <laughs> and I'm like, right over there? Right over there? Right over there? How about right over there? You know, you don't know right over there what that means. Now, you're, you're trying to have that person kind of share in your world, but individual, we don't think along those lines, the, the ones that do see, we don't think about those things. When somebody says, it's right over there, how does that be described to someone who's blind and visually impaired right over there, right? And, and I know a lot of times too, I know a lot of times when I go to a store, if I have my wife or my son with me, <coughs> who do you want to talk to? I have a cane, and the person starts to speak to the person that I'm with, and I'm the guy who's spending the money. So that usually gets me a little annoyed sometimes. It's like I go, I sit down at a restaurant, and then they say to my wife, what's he going to have? And I say, he is going to have. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> what's he going to have? You know. But I have to have forgiveness. And we do have forgiveness. Like I said, it's important that we are here to educate as well. So it doesn't help me by being angry with everybody who might misstep. Okay? because they don't know any better, and I have to realize that. So therefore, I can do something to help correct them in a very nice and friendly way, and this way, if there's someone else that comes down the road who's blind and visually impaired, they'll be able to help that person. Typical example, I was working for a company in Edison, and I had quite a few friends there, and there was one gentleman that ran up to me one morning, and he said, Sherlock, you're not gonna believe this. I said, what's going on, Rich, what's, what's up, what's up? He says, I was trying to help this guy, and then he just lost his mind on me in the middle of the, you know, in the middle of the street. I said, really? Then what'd you do? I'm someone who's blind. I said, Rich, close your eyes. <laughs> okay? Now you're focusing on the traffic. Things are going in front of you. They're, they're busy cars, back and forth, whatever the case is. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, there's a hand that comes and grabs you and says, I'm taking you across the street. Right? <laughs> How about if he's waiting for his friend on that side of the street? What do you think of that? you, you got to think about all these other things. He didn't want to go across the street. He wanted us to stay where he was because maybe his friend is going to meet him on that corner. I said, you need to, when you approach someone, you say, excuse me, can I assist you? Can I, you know, do, would, you need, would you like some assistance, right? And usually when you open the ball that way, then that gives me the opportunity for us to basically work together. But if you just assume and then you just try to take the role, I know what his needs, I can anticipate those needs, and I'm going to do this. Guess what that's going to happen? What's that going to mean? That means you're going to probably be wrong, right? Because what do they always say about you assuming? Okay, that's right. And we don't want to do that. So anytime when you feel that there's someone there, and remember I told you that, that people with disabilities, we're not bad people. We love to talk to you. We want to have a nice conversation or whatever the case is, but it's just all in the approach, right? Isn't it the same way with people who are excited and stuff? I mean, of course, you guys have a little heads up, right? That guy looks weird. He's got one blue shoe and one green shoe on. I'm getting away from this guy. But we don't have that, okay? Because a person's a person to us until they prove that they're not such a good person to us, okay? So we just always want to remember. <coughs> Anyone else have a question Can for I us? I, I, I have a question. I wanted to say something. Please, I Absolutely. Um,